Hi, I'm Robert Vlach from freelancing.eu, the first open directory of European freelancers and the friendly community of independent professionals. Today, I have a great pleasure to introduce you to Mark McGuinness, my friend and an outstanding professional. Mark is a creative coach who has been training, coaching and consulting other creative professionals long before a so-called creative economy was a thing. In this talk, he is explaining a crucial concept of building so-called creative assets, an important business strategy for creators as well as for other freelancers. He is explaining what it is, how to approach the strategy, and he's also giving some clear guidelines how to avoid various issues or problems along the way. The talk has been recorded as a part of our online Freelance Friends series, so make sure to subscribe to our channel or to our newsletter to get notifications about some future events. And now let me introduce Mark McGuinness, his talk, and he's all yours. So, first of all, I'd just like to just say well done all of us for showing up and making this event happen today um but you know we are freelancers as Rob has pointed out and that means there's nobody to take care of us unless we take care of ourselves there's no hr department there's no training there's no health and safety to say you know you're taking care you're getting enough personal professional development uh, these days. So well done each and every one of us for making time for this today. Um, on that note, uh, if we were in the same room, I would be saying at this point, now make sure you turn your phone off because you don't want to disturb each other. And the good news is if your phone goes off in the middle of this, it's not going to disturb anybody except it will disturb you. And so I'm inviting you to turn it off, put it on airplane mode. Uh, and the same goes for social media, other web browsers, any other interruptions or distractions, just, just turn them off and give yourself the gift of this half day with me and with the other speakers and with Rob and, and, and the rest of the community, because this is a, an opportunity for each of us to, to press pause at a very busy, it's always a busy time for freelancers, but this is um, particularly challenging time. And this is an opportunity for us all to press pause and step back and reflect on what we're doing, what we could be doing better, and also to give ourselves credit for, for the good things that we're already doing. So that will be, that will be a big theme of today. Now, um, on that note as well, if you want to take notes, because that's part of how you learn, that's great. But I do want to let you know that I will be sending you the ebook edition of my latest book, 21 Insights for 21st Century Creatives. That covers quite a few of the ideas that we're going to be talking about today. I'm also going to be sending you a long article on the theme of today's talk, and uh, there may well be a recording available. So in terms, you know, don't feel anxious that you need to write down all the information as I'm saying it, because there will be quite a lot that I'm putting forward for you to consider. So don't worry so much about remembering it or noting it down. Um, I want you to focus on being present and engaging with the ideas and reflecting on what they mean for you and for your business. So as Robert said, I am a poet and I am a coach for creative professionals. And um, I, I started out as a psychotherapist. So when I, I began coaching in the mid nineties, in the middle of my psychotherapy practice, when I discovered that I had um, some stressed out uh, and ambitious creatives in my clientele, um, I don't do the therapy anymore. I just do the coaching, but even so it's a pretty niche career path. It takes me a little while to explain it at cocktail parties. And um, Somehow, though, I have made it work and I'm very and it hasn't been plain sailing. It, there have been some certainly some 
rough episodes and ups and downs on the path. So what I would like to do today is to share a, a big idea, one of the core strategies that I have used to make it work and that I believe will help you to make your unusual career path work. Because um, now I know that not everybody here would self-identify as a creative or an artist. You wouldn't necessarily have that on your job title, but I do know that you're all freelancers. I do know that you are all therefore likely to be very independent minded. I have absolutely no doubt you bring originality and expertise and creativity to what you do. And um, I did have a, a good look at the material that I was presenting just to make sure it would be relevant to the whole range of freelancers. So don't you know worry if, if you said, well, I'm not a creative or an artist. This strategy will work for you just as much as it works for the artists and the poets among us. And, you know, this is, the title of today's talk is something that I find myself saying over and over again to coaching clients, because it really is the foundation, I think, of um, so much that I've done that can bring you more purpose and direction and even security as an independent um, freelancer or creative. So the title of the talk is Forget the Career Ladder, Start Creating Assets. So what do I mean by that? I'd like you to consider a scenario that you may well have encountered in real life. And that is you are at a family gathering of some kind. Maybe it's a holiday, maybe it's a family event or a wedding or a birthday or something like that. And at a certain point, the conversation turns to you and your generation and what you're all up to. And not for the first time, you're hearing quite a lot about your cousin George, who is a big success in the, in the big city. So cousin George, bless him, he has taken a rather more obvious and conventional creative path from your perspective. So he is in one of the professions. Maybe he's a lawyer or a doctor or a consultant or a manager in a big corporation. And the thing is, Cousin George's success is very easy for other people to see and understand because, you know, he's got yet another promotion, yet another pay rise, yet another fancy big office or new job title or um, he's driving around in, a, in an even bigger corporate car this year. And it's and, and good for him. Well done, George. Um, and, and, and yet at the same time, whenever the conversation comes around to you, it's it's a little more hesitant. It's a bit more. There's a few more questions along the lines of. So are you you still doing your your thing? Yeah. And and how's that going? Yeah, you, you still want to do, you know, and what you're getting is you're getting some version of why can't you be a little bit more like Cousin George? Because, you know, he's really made a success of his life. He knows what he's doing and where he's going. And and meanwhile, you know, you you're doing your thing and I don't quite understand. But maybe you could explain it to me again later. And of course, on one level, this doesn't really matter at all, does it? Because we do not want to be like Cousin George. We love him dearly but that is not the path that we are going to take. And yet, you know, we wouldn't be human if there weren't a few days, you know, when it's just us alone in the studio and maybe we get some bad news, a project falls through or somebody doesn't like our latest thing, whatever that is, or there's a tricky situation with a client and the little voice starts up at the back of your mind, you know, do you think your family's got a point? You know, what, what exactly is it you're doing, you know? And, and how are you any further on from this time last year or even 10 years ago? And, you know, on those days, it would be nice to have something to hold on to, would it not? As a, as a kind of sense of direction and, and purpose. The, because looking at it more positively, I think, what we want, you know, however avant-garde, however original, however out there we are, it, it, you know, certainly as, as the years go by, it would be nice to have a sense of purpose and direction and progression, to have a sense of, well, this is what I'm aiming for. And this means that if I, the hard work I put in today means that things will go well for me in the future. I can earn more money. I can have more opportunities with the effort that I put in. 
it would be nice if opportunities were coming to me rather than having to go out there and hustle quite so hard. You know, the energy that we have in our 20s and 30s, trust me, isn't it's not quite the same level when you get to 40s and 50s. And um, it's, it's also, you know, setting aside professional success, I think, again, we want to feel that we're making some kind of difference in the world, that the work we do isn't just for us or even just for our clients, but there's some kind of ripple effect or have you ever seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, we like to feel that we are contributing something <clears throat> to the wider community. And this is why I keep coming back to this idea of just forget the career ladder, forget Cousin George's path. It's not yours, it's not mine, it's not ours. It's actually, you know, if you pay attention to the news and the economic trends, the job for life and the secure career ladder are getting less and less secure. The world is slowly coming around to our way of thinking a little more. So, you know, the career ladder was never really an option for us. We want to do our own thing. And the frame I invite you to use around your work is this idea of creating assets. Now, what do I mean by an asset? Well, it's a, an accounting financial term, and it basically means an item of property that you own and which you generally acquire in the expectation of it generating future income. Um, so it might be a, a company that you buy, if you're a big player, or it might be a, some equipment that you invest in for your business. It might be, um, well, let me get some slides up because I'll show you a couple of distinctions. Okay, so, in terms of assets, if you go and see your accountant or your financial advisor, they will talk about probably two different types of asset. You have a tangible asset, which is, I don't know, a building or a factory or some equipment that goes into it. Uh, and stuff like intangible assets, which is things like um, copyrights, trademarks, um, software, um, stocks and shares, if you're trading. Now, I'm not here to talk about either of those categories today. Newsflash, this is not financial advice. Don't take financial advice from a poet, even Shakespeare. Um, but what I want to talk about today is a special category of assets that I believe that you and I can create out of thin air. And that is creative assets. And to illustrate what I mean by these, I'd like to talk about the case of a big star, somebody like on the level of Stephen King or Kate Bush or Neil Gaiman or whoever is at the top of the tree uh, of your own artistic field, creative field or field of expertise. This is somebody who, like, so as a thought experiment, imagine waking up and you are Stephen King or Kate Bush or whoever your um, favorite star may be. Are you worried about where your next gig is coming from? Or your next paycheck? Or your next exciting opportunity? No, of course you're not. And But why not? Now, on one level, the answer is obvious because you're Stephen King or Kate Bush or JK Rowling or whoever it may be. But if we dig a little deeper, it's not because these people are, there's something intrinsically magical about them. I mean, maybe there is and from a creative point of view, but we're talking today about career and opportunity. They're not the royal family. They weren't born into wealth and privilege. They work their way up. And if you look at their career, I would argue they have been very, uh, either consciously or unconsciously, they have been very clever and strategic at creating the right kind of assets. That means they're never lying awake at night worried about what cousin George is doing or where their next uh, paycheck is coming from. And so I'm going to break down the types of asset that these people have developed. And again, I want to just stress, I'm, I'm using them as an extreme example because we can all see exactly what separates them from the rest of us. But I don't want to, the separation to go too far because this is the same strategy that I reckon you and I can use, even if we're not quite uh, as far down the path as they are. So 
the number one asset that you will ever possess, and I say this to every single coaching client I work with, your number one most valuable asset is you. You are the biggest factor in your own success when you look at it in terms of assets. Your experience, your knowledge, your skills, your mindset and personality, your courage, your determination, your resilience. All of these are the qualities that you bring to bear on your next project, whatever that is. You can't create anything that you haven't somehow ingested, taken in from the world or, or um, dreamt up within yourself. From that, you are able to create a portfolio of work. So if you're the best-selling novelist, this is your back catalog of books. Or if you're a, a musician, this is albums. If you're a, um, a performer of any kind, this is the track record of what you've done. This is what people look at when they think of you and they say, well, he's, he or she is the person who did X, Y, and Z. Now, this can bring ongoing income from you in terms of royalty payments. It can also bring opportunities because people see what you've done and then they want to reach out and connect with you. Uh, it certainly makes it easier. If you can prove you've done something, next time you want to propose anything to someone else, they're going to look at what you've already done. And that will be a huge, uh, depending on how impressive that is, that makes their decision very easy. As well as the work itself, you have the intellectual property that is wrapped up in the work or associated with it. So if you've written a book, for instance, you have copyright in that. And so you can license it for adaptation into foreign language editions, into uh, movies, into TV series, into computer games or, or whatever. You may own trademarks that are associated with your work. And again, you can use that to protect and exploit your business. So there's quite a lot, particularly if you have a, a good lawyer, that you can do and a new business development person around exploiting the intellectual property and work that you've already created. And all of this feeds into your reputation. I mean, it's almost a stupid question that I was asking. If you're, Of course, if you're Steve King, you're not worried about your next gig because everybody knows your name. Everybody knows the quality of your work all the, the important people that you would ever want to work with, they know who you are and they probably want to work with you if you're ever interested. And so this is where we start to see that, you know, the, these in individual assets, they have isolated value, but where you really get the biggest benefit is when they start working together in concert. And then last but not least, I, we have the category of business assets. So you may well have a company that you use to do business with. You could have a team. You could have products. You could have service lines. You could have business models, uh, all of which help you to take advantage of the opportunities created by your work. So that's what life is like at the top of the tree if you're a big star. So what can we do? Well, I would say we should adopt pretty much the same strategy. Maybe we will never be as rich and famous as the stars, but you know, and you know, but don't let me stop you if that's what you would like to do. But the thing is this strategy works even if you don't become that rich and successful and famous, particularly with the new media landscape we've got with the internet and so on. It's, you can have 10% of that and still have a great life that is very fulfilling uh, creatively, personally, professionally, and very rewarding financially. So I'm going to talk through a little bit about my own experience, the kind of assets that I have created uh, around myself, my work, my business. And then we're going to turn the spotlight on you. And I'm going to ask you to consider these different types of asset what you already have, even if you haven't consciously thought about it in these terms, and then start to think about, well, what kind of assets would it benefit you to start creating going forward? So let's start with me. Um, I have always spent a lot of time throughout my career investing in myself, whether or not I thought about it in those terms or not. I love learning. I've always got some new 
skill or some new area of knowledge or a new language or um, a new verse form in poetry that I want to experiment with and learn. Um, and again, one point I'd like to make about asset creation is you really want to align, I'm talking about it as a strategy because we're thinking about your professional development, but it really becomes effective when you align your personal, your creative, your artistic, your intellectual interests with the kind of asset that you want to create. So let's break this down a little bit more. Experience is tremendously important to any freelancer. In one sense, people hire us because of our experience. And it's no secret that the more experienced you are, the, light, the more uh, your fees should reflect that. Um, obviously, professional experience is important here, but I'd like you to think about this on a wider level. You know, my experience as a poet, for instance, helps me absolutely in my work as a coach. My experience as a friend, as a husband, as a parent, all of that feeds into any work I do around relationships, around emotional intelligence with my clients, travel, study, success, failure. It all feeds into who I am. And that comes out in my poetry, in my writing and podcasting. And it's also something that I'm very happy to share with coaching clients whenever my experience seems relevant to them. Through this experience, I have made it an F, I've made an effort to develop my mindset, to build up some self-awareness and wisdom. I have done a lot of therapy. I've done a lot of meditation. I've worked with a lot of mentors and teachers and coaches. And some of that has resulted in improving my skills, but it's really, I've, I've been always on the lookout for, well, what are the blind spots in my own thinking? What are the limiting beliefs that hold me back? What new perspectives can I bring to bear on my work and my world that will open things up for me? Um, I've put qualifications fairly low down the list, not to say that um, they're not important, but they're not, I don't think they're the first thing, for instance, a freelancer's client wants to hear about. You know, very often we're, we might feel a little bit nervous. We want to show we're properly qualified to do this. I think if you're a freelancer, the first thing you need to do is to inspire somebody with the possibility of what they could achieve with your help. Um, so that's where, you know, the experience and the mindset are going to come to the fore. <laughs> Qualifications come a bit later on when they're excited and they start to think, okay, and, and who is this and what, what experience do you have? They're really good at reassuring. And of course, the most important point of qualifications is it shows that you have studied hard, you have learned hard, you've stretched yourself. They are, they are the, uh, a side effect, I would say, rather than the, the main important, the most important thing. And last on this list, I have included habits, which again, some of this stuff will appear on a CV or a resume. Um, probably like you, it's been quite a while since I had to do a, a CV in my line of work, but some of this stuff would never appear on it. Like habits wouldn't appear on that. But for instance, a number of years ago, I really made an effort to develop a very robust writing habit, a creative process that means if I set my mind to a new writing project or media project, whether that's a new book or a new podcast or a new training course or whatever, I know that I will follow through and execute and make that happen. I've found ways of getting past you know, the resistance and distraction and, and whatever. So it's almost like I've got a, a little gadget in the corner of the office that when it's time to write a book, I switch the gadget on and I come back six months later. Uh, and there it is. I mean, it's, sadly, it's not quite that streamlined yet, but um, but there is that sense of this is, you know, to me, that's absolutely an asset. It's it's something I know I can rely on. Okay, enough about me. I'm um, talking of portfolio. This is what my portfolio consists of: um, poems. Uh, obviously, I'm going to put that first. Those are closest to my heart. I have books. I have podcasts. And um, I have blogs that I've been writing since about 2006. 
So all of these things make it easy for people to find me um, online, as Rob showed earlier on. I mean, you know, who, little did I know that the day I was penning that piece about Shakespeare with my quill pen, um, that one day it would mean that Rob would find it and that he would invite me along to talk to you all today. So you, it, it's, you never quite know when you put yourself out into the world. The way I think of it, if I put good stuff out there, consistently and in a format that people can find, magical things start to happen. Actually, and I've realized I've screwed up here. There's one thing missing from my portfolio, which I'm also very proud of, which is my track record of work with clients. So, um, and I'll talk a bit more about this later on. If a lot of our work as freelancers is ephemeral, it's project work, it's events, it's performances. Um, so it's important that you document that and put it out there in the world. So the way I do it is I have a load of testimonials from clients um, on my website, and I sometimes have clients come on the podcast and talk about their journey. So that's a way of making that part of my, my back catalogue, if you like, available to people. All right, intellectual property. So here I have several trademarks that I own via my company that I use to protect the business. I'm aware of copyright and I take advantage of licensing um, in a few cases like um, foreign edition, foreign language editions of my books. Um, I also think of, you know, it's easy to think of intellectual property purely in terms of protection of what it stops people doing, but it's also possible to flip it and say, well, I would like people to, to take this and share it. So one thing I've done several times is release uh, a, a short book, an ebook, under a Creative Commons license, which basically says you're allowed to take this and copy it and share it and republish it as long as you credit me as the author, as long as you don't change it in any way, and as long as you don't exploit it commercially. So... Yeah, and, and that just comes from an awareness of, of how copyright works. I can grant people the right to do that. Several of those ebooks went viral, downloaded a, a load of copies, and brought a lot of opportunities to me. Okay, so reputation. <clears throat> now, here's where I need to keep my ego in check. Um, Rob said some very nice things about me earlier on, and I really appreciate that. I try not to get too caught up in it, but it's also... I, I'm pleased from a professional point of view by what he, he told me because it shows that the assets that I create are doing their job because that's why I'm here with you today. I didn't reach out to Rob. Rob reached out to me years ago. We became friends. We've done a few things together. We will no doubt do more together in time. And, you know, Rob is helping to spread the word here today. So the ways that I have done that, I like to write, I like to record, I like to create media. So I've spent time building up my websites via blogs. Um, I have two podcasts, one for my coaching, uh, one for creatives, and another one about poetry. I've been building email lists for a long time. This is a very, very important asset to me, far more important, in my opinion, than social media. Although for certain projects and certain uh, activities, it is really important. So um, you've, you've also got to think about your own priorities. So it, it, depending on your niche, um, some of these will be more or less important. This is what's important to me. Um, and last but not least, down here at the bottom is the network. Now, you know, Rob is part of my network. There are other people, professionals, friends whose work I really respect, people that I like to keep close. And I know plenty of people who don't do much of this other online stuff, but who are really good at networking and building relationships. And if that is you, then use your superpower. Um, you don't necessarily have to do it the way I do. And then finally, in terms of business assets, I have a company. It's a small company. Uh, there's just two of us. There's me and Mammy, my business partner, who also happens to be my wife. So that is a doubly important partnership. Um, but it is actually, you know, we've been in business together for about 18 months now, and it's really changing the way that I work because I have someone to talk to 
with and about the business and we make plans together and we're coming up with much more uh, creative and, and interesting and also fun things to do together. Um, we have a range of products, in my case, mostly books. We have service offerings. We're both coaches. And um, we also are keen to use different business models for different projects. Now, I could spend a lot of time talking about business models, but to me, a business model is a system for creating value. And the more creative you can be at designing a great system, the more value you generate for people around you and also for yourself. So that could be a whole other uh, point of discussion. In fact, there's a really good book. If you haven't seen it, Business Model Generation by Alexander Osterwalder and Yves Penier, um, which if you're interested in business models and, and taking a really creative approach to creating value with your business, that's a great book to check out. Okay, so that's me. Let's start to talk about you and your assets. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through these categories fairly quickly again, just to refresh your memory. And then I'm going to invite you to take five minutes with a pen and paper to do a quick inventory, firstly, of the assets that you already have in each of these categories. Um, and hopefully that will be a nice and reassuring that you are wealthier than you had realized. Um, and then I also want to think you to think in each of those categories, what other assets would it be good for me to create? What would start to unlock the most value for me going forward and give me that strategic direction that I know where I want to head? So in terms of you, like I say, this is always the most important asset. So think about your experience inside of work and outside. Anything that's ever happened to you, you know, your whole life, from when you were born, growing up with your family, experiences with friends, the culture that you've been part of, the people you've spent time with, the relationships you've had, the travel that you've had, uh, the places you've gone to, um, all the work projects and other projects outside of work, this can all feed in. And very often I find the most compelling and original freelancers and creators are the ones who, who aren't afraid to bring the whole self to work and to really um, bring a lot of their personality and experience there. Anything you can do to develop your mindset, any form of personal development, personal growth, challenging yourself in different ways. On the one level, it's important to do just for yourself and your own happiness and, and well-being. But if we're looking at it in terms of business, it, this can be a surprisingly valuable asset for you. Same goes for skills and qualifications from time to time. I think we all want to have a, a look and say, are my skills still current? Are there things that I could add to the skill set that would make me more valuable uh, going forward? And last but not least, the habits. You know, what are my daily habits? What are my weekly habits? And, and what am I achieving over the rhythm of a year? Um, and which of these areas, I'll put these all up together on a slide at the end. So you don't, again, you don't need to write all of this down, but start thinking now, which of these areas would it be good for you to, to focus on next? Then your portfolio. This can be, um, if you're an artist, obviously artworks. If you, Whether or not you're an artist, media can be important. So you could be a consultant or a craftsperson or, or another kind of freelancer. And yet media is very important. You might have a YouTube channel or a podcast or a newsletter, a way of getting your um, work out into the world. Obviously, if you're something like a filmmaker or, or an author, um, that becomes especially important. You may have a range of products. Um, as I said earlier on, you may have a set of projects. You know, if you're a consultant uh, or if you're an events organizer, then a lot of your work in one sense will be ephemeral. So it's important that you document it and you present it uh, on your website and elsewhere so that people can really see what you have achieved. Same goes for performances. If you are an actor, singer, musician, public speaker of any kind, you wanna find a way of, of documenting performances, whether video, photo, reviews, testimonials, um, your own write-ups of the experience. Um, 
just so that when somebody, for instance, comes to your website, they can see what you have done. You know, what, what is in the my work section of your website? Intellectual property. Again, um, trademarks, if you have a company name, I urge you to get that protected by trademark um, and any other brands that are associated with your company. Educate yourself about copyright and specifically the kind of work that you create. What are the um, things that you need to watch out for instead of in terms of protecting yourself, avoiding infringing other people, but also exploiting and creating more value from the work that you've already done. Uh, it may be helpful to get a specialist advisor or a really good intellectual property lawyer to help you with this. Patents or patents, depending on how you like to pronounce it. This is really for the inventors among us, the ones developing new products. Um, you may well be able to patent the process or the product. It's a very specialist area. If you're in that field, you probably know about it already, but you also know how extremely valuable a patent can be. Uh, it's not easy to get, but um, you could be the next Tetra Pak millionaire if you manage to, to figure that one out. Reputation, um, you would like to be found. You would like, I take it for an email to come through with uh, an opportunity when you wake up in the morning. Um, you could be lucky and get somebody really nice like Robert reaching out and who knows where that could take you. Like I said, start with your network, the people who are already close to you, um, make sure you keep those relationships strong. Um, you. If you're really good at this, if you're particularly extroverted and keen to get out and about, then um, go for it and spend the lion's share of your time there. If you've got any inclination to create media, to write, to speak, to record, to make videos or whatever, there's an awful lot, as I'm sure you're aware, that you can do online. Also, when I say media channels here, it could be other people's media channels. It could be somebody's podcast or a TV show or a radio show or getting featured in a magazine. So maybe a PR strategy would be important for you, depending on your niche. And if you're sat there thinking, do I really have to do this? Yes, you really have to do this. Um, and just think it could be worse. I mean, you may be an introvert, but so am I. Not only that, I'm a poet. And not only that, I'm British. So I couldn't have it any more difficult in terms of shyness and unwillingness to get myself out there. And yet I managed to overcome it because I saw the value to my business and to my career. And really, honestly, if I can do it, you, you can do it. <laughs> it's really not that hard. And it's actually a lot of fun once you break through that initial fear. Business assets. Um, if you are a freelancer, I assume you have a company. Even if you're a, a sole trader, there's obviously various um, company uh, structures that you can use. You may have a team, but even if it's just you, or even it's just you and a partner, you, you know, even if you don't have people on the payroll, I'm sure you have trusted collaborators. Uh, you may well have a network of um, contractors that you rely on to deliver various products. And, you know, those relationships, that virtual team, again, that's an important asset. Product range, service offerings, and like I said, business models, these are all areas where you can grow the value of the business, even if you don't necessarily take on more people into the team. So what I would like you to do now is to take five minutes to have a look at this list. I know I've done the thing you should never do with a slide, which is cover it with words. Seth Godin would not be impressed, but um, I'm just doing it in this case so that you've got it as a reference. So I'd like you to, Take five minutes to go through the list. You, your portfolio, your intellectual property, reputation, and business assets. And first of all, on one side of the sheet of paper, write, this is what I already have. These are assets maybe I, I wasn't fully aware of that I can really consciously make use of in future. And on the other side, these are all the assets that I would like to create that would benefit me and my business going forward. And um, don't worry, you know, this is a wish list. Don't worry about overwhelming yourself. Just put the list down and we can talk about priorities later. So just, just be with that for a minute. 
allow yourself to experience the excitement. Try not to get too overwhelmed or too daunted by the other feeling because this is your life's work we're talking about. This isn't about you doing this by next week. So again, prioritizing and, and planning is a whole other uh, session we could talk about. But what I would do is to say, look at the list of assets you haven't created yet, and then ask yourself to think about what is the next asset I want to create? Because you can only really create one at a time. And to me, this is a really important part of strategizing as a freelancer, as a small business owner. I do this three times a year with Mammy, my business partner. This, we do this after Christmas, we do that after Easter, and we do it in September. And we think about the next four months and we think about, among other things, we think about what asset do we each want to be working on between now and the next time we review it. And it's really important. So for instance, now my next focus is gonna be season six of my 21st Century Creative Podcast. Earlier this year, I was launching my poetry podcast so that was my focus. And you know what, if I come out this year with a new season of my old podcast and a completely new podcast launch, I really do feel that I've got something that I'm moving forward on uh, that is going to give me a sense of momentum and progression and might even make Cousin George be slightly impressed. And you think, oh, so it's not just, you're not just mucking about sitting in that office on your own. So, um, Okay, so that's what I would invite you to do. Think about maybe from now until the end of the year, what single asset would you like to focus on? Uh, that would really, uh, your main criteria is if I do this or I get started on this, I'll really feel I'm making progress in my freelance business. Um, and then do this every few months. And that's the simplest way that you, you can prioritize and make progress. So. 